Well, good morning, Coleraine Church. It's good to be here with you this morning, and I just want to take this morning as we begin to say uh, Happy Mother's Day. I was reflecting as I drove down here on how it's because of this place that I feel like I have not only my own mother, but many surrogate mothers because of this place that I'm incredibly thankful for, and I think Patrick and I both feel that way. And so as we begin this morning, I just want to pray a blessing over the mothers that are here. Father God, this morning we come to the throne of grace with joy to lift up those in our lives that we have called mom. Lord, this morning we pray for those mothers who in some way, in any way, may feel like they're struggling. And we pray this morning that you would draw them close to you and remind them of your perfect love. For those mothers who maybe right now are filled with the joy of the Lord, and are, are showing their children what that looks like. We pray that you would continue to fulfill your joy in their lives, and we thank you for them. For those mothers today who may be mourning lost children, we pray, Father, that you would strengthen them and draw them close, and again, remind them of your perfect love. For those mothers who decided that other parents were the best choice for their babies, we pray blessing over them and blessing over the moms who adopted those babies into their families and have loved them fiercely. For those who long to be mothers but have experienced the, the desperation and then the pain of infertility, we lift them up to you right now and we pray over them that they would remember that your timing and your will in their lives is perfect. For those who mothered colleagues, mentees, neighborhood kids, children's friends, and anyone who maybe needed the love of a mother, we thank you for the mother's hearts that, would, that you've instilled in them. For those whom this day is difficult, maybe reflecting on a relationship with a mother that wasn't what they wished it would be, or reflecting on the, the loss of a mother, again, we pray that you would hold them close today and remind them of your perfect love. Father, on this Mother's Day, very simply, we thank you for moms, for what they mean to us. Today, we pray blessing over them in our lives. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, before we uh, dive in this morning uh, with worship, um, I felt that I needed to share a story from something that happened to me this week, a reminder of just how incredible the Holy Spirit of God is that he knows and supplies for our needs. Wednesday night, I, uh, I finished work at my normal time and had a barber appointment later than I would normally go, so I had a little bit of time to kill, and I was spring cleaning my room for the last week, week and a half or so, and as I cleaned out one of the closets, I pulled down a box containing just random things, and the thing sitting on top of it was this little black notebook, and this was a notebook I was given, I think, sometime during my senior year of college. I don't remember how I came upon it, but this was a notebook I had in my bag with me for every day for two to three years, and in this book is notes on my personal study of the Bible, my thoughts on church, my my random thoughts about God I would just have during the day, my reflections on my faith, and to be honest, the random scribblings of an occasionally bored young man. But uh, for instance, I the very first page I opened to was a page I titled, What are the church's responsibilities? And I start here, the church is Christ's bride. Does that truth impact how we view the church? Because it should. <clears throat> this notebook is filled with very random things. But as I sat and thumbed through this on Wednesday night, I realized 
that I don't do this as often as I should do this. And I don't spend the intentional time reflecting on the things of God as much as I used to or as much as I should. Most of my time spent in the scripture each week is spent to prepare for a sermon on Sunday morning. This isn't to say I spend no time in the word, but I don't find myself reflecting on it and thinking on it like I once did even just a few years ago. And I thought about this for a while and I left to go to my barber appointment. And as I drove, I continued to think about this. And as I sat in the barber chair with my barber, who is also a fellow brother in the Lord, we had our usual conversations that two men have while one is cutting the other's hair. Politics, sports, very normal barbershop, barbershop conversations. And because I was the last haircut for the day, we were alone in his shop. And about halfway through the haircut, out of nowhere, as we're having these conversations about politics and sports, he looks me in the eyes through the mirror and asks very pointedly, how has your personal study of the word been? Embarrassed and caught off guard by the question, I shook it off like we all too often do and said, it's been good, with a smile on my face. And he looked at me for a few seconds and said, can I pray for you right now? And I said, yes. And that brother put his hand on my shoulder and prayed for several minutes about the very things I had been thinking about for the last hour and a half. That my personal study of the word would be strong, that I would be reflecting on the things of God, and that I would find the Lord speaking to me in it. And even now, as I tell the story, I again have chills. That I would encounter Jesus in his word and that my rest would be restorative. And as soon as he said amen, I looked at him in the mirror and said, I have to tell you something. And I proceeded to tell him about the last two hours of my night. And he told me that as he asked that question that he felt was from the Holy Spirit, he heard the Spirit say, you have to pray for him even if he says no. And I have been in awe each time I think about Wednesday night, and I think I will be for the rest of my life, because I feel like I've been reminded, and I need to remind you, that the Holy Spirit knows your needs, and he provides for them. Sometimes in the form of a brother or sister who's going to pray for you, whether or not you say yes or no. The Holy Spirit has not left you or abandoned you, and he is right here. Before we worship, we again pray with me this morning. Father, it's good to be gathered in this place this morning to reflect on who you are and what you have done. Father, I just keep thinking of the words of the high priestly prayer of Jesus that, you, that he wants his joy to be fulfilled in how we live our lives. Father, when his joy isn't being fulfilled in our lives or when we have strayed, as we so often do, I thank you for a Holy Spirit that's diligent to bring us back, to remind us of your good and perfect love. I have chills as I think about the goodness of who you are, God. Lord, for our time this morning, for our time of worship, I pray that we would simply get out of the way and allow our hearts to adore you for who you are. And as we open your scripture together this morning, we pray as always that we would simply put you on display in this place and watch as you draw people to yourself because you want community and relationship with your creation. You will draw people to yourself. And Lord, we pray as always a, a statement from the high priestly prayer of Jesus that you would continue to sanctify us in the truth. And we know that the word of God is the truth. And we thank you for that. Again, just be with our hearts. Be with us now as we worship you. Uh, allow our hearts to wholly fixate on you and you alone right now, knowing that you alone are worthy of worship and worthy of praise. We pray all these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's so good to see you here today. I want to say happy Mother's Day. And um, I'm incredibly thankful to have my mom and my dad here this morning. And it's good to see Leanne's mom and dad. And yeah, mom and dad here this morning, too. They love you both. Love you guys. Let's all stand together. 
in Ezra 3.11, it says, And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. And that's who we serve this morning. That's who he is today. Let's join in worship and sing Raise a Hallelujah. Oh, wait. 
testimony behind this song. Um, there's a verse that says, how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. Now, I might get this wrong, but is this, so my mom and dad heard this song when, were you pregnant with me? I was the first time after, it was the first time after I had you, I heard this song. Okay. I yeah. had you in church, and we found Jesus after I had you. Yeah. But the first time I heard this song was right after you were born. It's amazing. So, yeah, so they heard this. <laughs> um, yeah, so my mom heard this song, like, shortly after I was born. And that verse really stuck out to them. And I never, of course, I wouldn't have known that because I was little, you know. But she told me, like, recently. And, um, but, uh, man, it's amazing that how the joy that the Lord feels in our hearts, you know. And, uh, man, so I'm excited to have my dad here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to put the mic like this so he can help sing. Set. <laughs> 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 
Church, and uh, several, some of you might remember a year and a half or two years ago, Kendall was here, uh, Kendall Killer was here on behalf of Black Rock Retreat. Well, since then, 
Black, uh, Kendall has moved on from BlackRock, and lo and behold, he went with another organization that Wesley uh, also supports. Um, and one of the things serving on the mission committee that uh, I feel really blessed by is so many organizations will tell us we simply could not do what we do without Wesley's support because we are a large supporter of many organizations. And Kendall's here today to just share a little of what they're able to do through your generous uh, giving. And I do want to point out the thing that he's talking about today was the clothing drive that you might remember you guys were a part of, all of Wesley was a part of um, January. And I would like to point out, out of the three campuses, not that it's a competition, but this church gave the most of all three churches. So we, I just wanted to commend you on, on that. Well, it's a blessing to be here. Um, continue to support BlackRock. They're a great ministry. My daughter gets to work there on, on uh, summer staff this, this coming summer for her uh, third summer. So um, just great, uh, great continued relationship with them. But I work for a ministry now called Serve Now. And the tagline is Serve Now, Procrastinate Later. And um, what, what I'm going to show you here is a, a brief video of a, a, one of the pastors that we partner with. Serve Now partners with pastors all around the world, in Africa and in India. Um, but there's a pastor whose church is located right on the border of Mexico in Brownsville, Texas. And I don't know what you would do if your church was located right on the border of Mexico in the particular situation we're in with so many uh, folks coming across the border and just how would your church choose to serve? I mean, that's what Jesus called us to do, right? Serve now. Serve the, the needs in front of us. And so um, what uh, this pastor does, you're going to see a brief video of he seeks to serve the legal refugees that come across the border and uh, seeks to serve them with the love of Christ. Um, so I uh, thank you for being a part of this. So back in January, what we didn't know, and here's what really struck me. As you shared your story and as I uh, just thought about, you know, a little baby, it's the little things we, we, can, we might think, well, I only have a few moments. I only have this little bit of money. I only have some leftover winter clothes that don't fit me anymore. But what God can do with just a little bit that we give to him is a beautiful thing. And so I, I hope that's what we can celebrate today. What one mother can do in just one, you know, just a few years of life can impact the rest of the life of that child. So um, there's some pictures up here of some of the clothing that was collected uh, between uh, Wesley and between uh, Mount Vernon Church, where I go, and um, Andrews Bridge. We collected 44 large boxes, so many boxes that we had to ship them on a truck. And um, BB's Grocery Out, thankfully, was willing to let us use their dock, which saved us several hundred dollars of shipping costs, because if you can get a dock pickup, you, it's, it's more efficient. So these, these 44 boxes of winter clothing get shipped down in early February. And what we didn't know when we were collecting clothes was that February was going to be one of the coldest months in that area. And Pastor Navarro, who you're about ready to meet, said these clothes came at just the right time. And, and, and he not only was able to distribute those clothes, guess how long it took him to distribute 44 boxes of clothing? One day. <laughs> they had the need, and God was supplying the need through you. So um, these boxes were distributed. You're going to see a video here in just a minute. Um, but let me just read to you a most recent update from Pastor Navarro. So this would have been about two weekends ago. He said this, uh, and we get these stories from around the world from different churches we partner with. Um, this is a, a most recent story. So over the weekend, Pastor Navarro impacted 83 migrants in one weekend with 36 decisions to follow Christ. You talk about a moment in time. He has just a, mo a few moments, a few days to interact with these folks, and he shares the gospel. Serve Now provides little booklets in Spanish language that he's able to distribute and share with them. I have a few in the back if you'd just like to see a copy. He said, thanks for all the support. I got the okay from the mayor to reopen next month. So he goes to uh, the, the, train, the 
bus station and interacts with them there, but soon their church is going to be opened as a respite center again, and you'll get to see that in this video. By the way, reopen means reopening the church as a respite center for legal immigrants as their first stop before going on to their sponsor family to await their court date for a decision as to whether they can begin process the process of living in the U.S. So meet Pastor Navarro, and then I just have a couple wrap-up comments. Reverend Carlos Navarro stands on a platform of empathy to make people feel welcome in a new country. Well, geography and uh, culture, the, their food, their gastronomics and all that. So this is what I use to break the ice and identify with them. Voy a ver por acá. ¿Cómo están, muchachos? ¿Cómo les van? ¿De, de, 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 de qué parte son ustedes? De Honduras. Hola, hola. Eh, Navarro and his congregation from Iglesia Bautista West Brownsville are happy to welcome newly arrived migrants, mostly from Central and South America. The greetings are a regular thing at the Brownsville Metro bus station. Here, church volunteers hand out food, drinks, and clothing. The church leader says he helps this population for two primary reasons. First, it's the Christian thing to do. And perhaps on a more personal level, he can identify with asylum seekers and the hardships they've been through. In 1982, Navarro fled his native country during one of the most violent periods of Guatemala's 36-year civil war. That same year, General Efrain Rios Mont seized power in a bloody military coup, dissolving the nation's 1965 constitution and Congress, suspending all political parties. An estimated 200,000 people were killed in the conflict. On top of the regular outreach at the bus stop, the man of God opened the doors to his church. Let's go, let's go. As a respite center to new arrivals. And this is the building, so you can have an idea. <clears throat> Look at this. This is the showers, men's showers and toilets. Look, it's so nice and clean. We have a washer and dryer. We have a lots of towels. To be clear, this was not here for your congregation. No, no. What is this for? It was built especially for migrants. It was approximately uh, $65,000. Whether Navarro's actions are seen as serving the Lord or serving others in need, his church delivers on the front line of compassion and empathy. God, we thank you for our pastor. We thank you for his family. We thank you for our church. Ignoring loud political noise on this issue ringing from afar. Just on the other side of the international border, directly behind me in Matamoros, there are shelters that are now also helping out like the pastor we featured in that story. Every one of those shelters, from what I've seen, and I've personally gone inside each and every one, they're full. Now, the directors at those facilities tell me that as more and more people continue to make their way to the southern border, they plan on opening up more beds. On the border in Brownsville, John Salazar, Spectrum News. So Pastor Navarro is one of many pastors around the world that are seeking to serve God in their community. And if you'd like to read more stories about uh, Serve Now's partnerships with churches around the world, there's a book. I put a couple in the back there. If, if we run out, I have box uh, over two boxes at home. Um, just wasn't sure how many to bring here. So I have uh, my card back there. If you'd like to uh, just get a copy of the book, just pick up my card, send me an email. I'll make sure you get one. I can bring more to the church later. Um, but yeah, this book just tells, it's written by Steve Foley's son, Ben Foley, who's the president of Serve Now. And uh, yeah, just love for you to get a copy of that. And if you're wondering, is there anything I can do? Um, back there, I do have a copy of our quarterly report. The reason I brought this along is because one of the things that's unique about Serve Now, because we partner around the world, it's amazing how far a little bit can go. And $10 a month can change somebody's life. And I mean that literally. It can change somebody's life. 
Um, so do whatever you can as God leads, but thank you for what you've already done and happy Mother's Day and thanks to all the moms who just in a little bit of time uh, are impacting, continue to impact the, the lives of us kids, right? <laughs> all right, good to, good to be here with you. I was wondering if he was joking about the slogan being served now, procrastinate later, and then I saw it on a sweater, and I'm a size XL if you want to drop one off. <laughs> I think that is absolutely brilliant. I love that. And I could have used that reminder in college many times. Oh my goodness, church, it's good to be here together this morning. We're going to dive right in this morning. Last week, we looked together at the first half of John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. We looked at what it means to view Jesus as our great high priest. And in John chapter 17, we have his longest recorded prayer taking place just moments or hours before his betrayal and arrest that would ultimately lead to Calvary. And there is such a beauty in looking at what Jesus prayed over his disciples just right before he would go to the cross for them and for the world and show the world the greatest display of love that has ever existed. Uh, we saw last week that he prayed in John 17 that he would be glorified, not for his own sake or for his own glory, but so that on the cross, the Father would be glorified in what he did there, that the salvation plan of God was going to be fulfilled in his death. And he prayed that God, the Father, would glorify him with the glory that they shared before the world existed, making it plainly known again that Jesus didn't just know God the Father, but that he and the Father were one, that Jesus was God who took on human flesh. And he talked about manifesting the name of God, that we are called not just to make the name of God known, but to manifest it and live out who he is radically and unashamed in this life. And he prayed that God would keep them, that he would sustain them, referring to the disciples. And we're going to see a continuation of that request in the second half of the high priestly prayer this morning. And finally, the last thing we looked at in verse 13 was that he prayed that the joy, that his joy would be fulfilled in their lives. And that's a critical part of this prayer because a life lived with Jesus is a life of joy. No matter what this world throws at us, no matter what difficulties may come across, the joy of the Lord is still supposed to be our strength. No matter what this world can do to us, we can have joy in knowing where our final destination is and who holds us close. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me again to John chapter 17. We're gonna pick up in verse 14 and go to the end of the chapter. This is what Jesus continued to pray over his disciples. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that, and these know that you have sent me. 
I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Verse 14 uh, picks up with an echo of the manifestation of the name of the Father that Jesus had prayed previously. Jesus says, I have given them your word. So many people over the last 2,000 years from different religions, different backgrounds, and different faiths want to relegate Jesus to being just a good teacher, but nothing more than that. Even Muslims, should you get the chance to interact with them, will talk about Jesus as a great prophet, but they take great issue when we talk about the deity of Jesus, that he was indeed fully God. But Jesus, how he spoke about himself, especially all throughout the book of John, does not leave any room for us to only call him a great teacher and not God himself. And this is what he means by manifesting the name of God. He says, I have given them your word, not simply by his verbal teaching alone, but in who he is, in the power he's displayed in his miracles, in the, in the in innumerable prophecies he has displayed, or fulfilled, I'm sorry, fulfilled before their eyes. Jesus has shown them who the Father is through his actions, through his words, through, through even his personality. He has shown them the Father over the last three years. And as a direct result of this, the world has not only taken notice of Jesus, but it has taken notice of his disciples as well. And in seeing Jesus and seeing who he is, the world has hated him. And Jesus knows that there is a time coming, and it's coming soon at this point when he's praying the high priestly prayer. There is a time coming when he's not going to physically be here for the eyes of the world to be on him. And the hatred of the world that he is facing and is about to face as he's about to be betrayed and arrested, that same hatred is soon going to be directed at the disciples. And it will be directed at all those who call him Lord. And then we see this being true. We see this being fulfilled uh, in the disciples. In the, of the original disciples, 11 were martyred. Only one died of old age, and he did so having been exiled. And so in his prayer, Jesus again makes it plainly known that to follow him, to follow Jesus, to have him be Lord of your life, is to accept that the world is going to hate you. It's to accept that there will be persecution in this life. And for so many of our brothers and sisters around the world, that is a reality they face every single day. For Jesus to be the Lord of their life is to put their life on the line every day that they go out. Look at verses 15 through 19. What does he pray for as a result of this? The world is going to hate us, so what does he pray? I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they, may also, that they also may be sanctified in truth. We need to notice what Jesus is saying here and what Jesus isn't saying here. It's from these verses from the high priestly prayer that we get that famous statement that so many of us have made that I know that I've made several times from up here to be in the world, but not of the world. And if we dig into what he's saying here, we can get to see exactly what this looks like. Firstly, he makes it known that to be a follower of Jesus, to know him as Lord, to walk with him every day, means to fully and completely leave behind the ways of the world. It means that we don't get to be friendly and rub shoulders with the way the world lives. In short, God cannot have relationship and community with sin. He cannot have community with worldliness. So we are not able 
in this life to have our cake and eat it too. We don't get to live the way the world lives and still call Jesus Lord of our lives. We don't get to enjoy the carnal sins of this world and hold fast to Jesus at the same time because those things are simply incompatible. So what does Jesus pray knowing this? That they would be removed from the world, to set apart from it completely? No, in fact, quite the opposite. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. Jesus isn't calling us to sequester ourselves from the world. He isn't calling us to cloister ourselves off on a mountaintop somewhere and separate ourselves completely from those who disagree with us. He, he isn't calling us as well. We have to be really careful of this. And I realized this when I found myself living in one. We've got to be really careful to not put ourselves in an echo chamber bubble, surrounding ourselves only with people who agree, think, talk, and act like us. That's a really dangerous way to live. No, he says, Father, do not take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil one. In this life, we're going to have temptation just as he faced. We're going to have run-ins with the enemy just as he did. We're going to feel the depths of spiritual warfare in our life. That Those things are going to happen if we actively walk with Jesus every day. But something else is going to happen if we continue to walk with him that allows us uh, to directly combat the evil one in our lives. We are going to become more like him more like Jesus. Every day that we walk with him, every day that we worship him, every day that we commune with him, every day that we dig into and reflect on his word, we are going to become more like him by the power of his Holy Spirit in our lives, who he has said started an incredible work in our lives and wants to see it through to completion. And if you've been coming to this church for any amount of time, even if this is literally your second week here, you have heard me pray verse 17 over this place so many times. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. When we value God's word, when we spend time in it, when we begin to live out its truth through the Holy Spirit in our lives, we become more like his son. And it's vital that we continue to become more like him because verse 18 is very clear that just as the father sent his son into the world, now he is sending his disciples into the world. And that's not just the 11 men gathered around him in that circle. That's everyone who calls him Lord. So we know we're going to face temptation and evil in this world. And the call of Jesus isn't, well, we'll separate yourself from it. It's you're going to be among it, but your holy, my Holy Spirit is going with you and it is your charge to impact the world and not be impacted by the world. And it's a beautiful foreshadowing of just a few weeks from this moment when he's praying this prayer with his disciples, just a few weeks from this day, he's going to commission them with the Great Commission just before he ascends back to the Father, because the world needs to know what has happened, what he has done for it. And that situation is still very much the same for us today. The Great Commission still applies. It's still relevant in our lives right now, and it's going to be until the day all of this is brought to a conclusion, because there will always be people in this life unaware of what our God has done for them. And it is for that reason that we see Jesus say in verse 20, and this is important, I don't ask these things for these only, referring to the 11 disciples around him. No, I ask these things for all those who will believe because of their word. And I don't know if you understand the gravity of what he's saying here. Should you ever find yourself doubting the intercession of Jesus, I urge you to run back to John 17 because if you call Jesus Lord right here, he's making it clear in verse 20 that he intercedes and he's prayed for you. This was a prayer for everyone who believed because of the testimony of 
the disciples. I like to think that someday in glory, when we are together on the new earth, we're going to be able to see this, uh, some kind of spiritual family tree, a lineage from Jesus to us. As we so often see in the Old Testament, we get name after name after name after name. And sometimes it's a little hard to make it through those names because we don't really know who all these people are. But I imagine a spiritual family tree, beginning with his Jesus, with the, with the disciples branching off and eventually leading the whole way down to us. And we can see all those who came before us that, that Jesus lived and worked through. I, I was curious on this, I, and I, I did the math because I wanted to know if we're, we're looking at a little over 2,000 years with an average lifespan of maybe 40 to 50 years. From, from the generation of the, the disciples of Jesus to now, we're only looking at roughly 40 generations. And I don't know why, but I thought that number was going to be so much bigger than that. And how incredible it is to think of all of those who come before us and all of those who will come after us that will know Jesus and his grace and his work and his power because of what he's doing in our lives right now. And to know that Jesus himself in this prayer in verse 20 is praying for those who are going to believe by the testimony of the disciples. And by doing so, he's praying for us directly. And I urge you to read this prayer each day over this next week and soak in every word of all of John chapter 17 and know that the things he's praying here in John chapter 17 he is praying for you right now. Even so, he is still interceding and praying these things for you. And after stating that he prays this, not just for the disciples, but for all those who would believe by their testimony, he begins to close his prayer out with two things, two things I believe the church would do very well to remember. The first thing was mentioned already in the first half of the prayer we looked at last week. And so to request it a second time is confirmation of just how important it is. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. When things are in the Bible, we've talked about this so many times, when something in the Bible is repeated, it's crucial that we pay attention to it. Think of Jesus as he's reinstating Peter after Peter's denial. He asks him the same question three times. And as the repetition happens, Peter begins to become more and more alarmed. Repetition has power in this age. And Jesus is praying for, for unity, not just once, not just twice, but three times. And I think that's something probably worth highlighting, circling and underlining and drawing a circle around it so you're sure to have your attention drawn to it. The call for unity in the church and unity among believers is so far beyond just wanting people to be nice to one another or to get along. The call for unity repeated three times here is so that the relationship we have as a body of believers, the relationship that the church has perfectly emulates and shows the world the unity and bond that the Father has with the Son. Why is that important? Jesus says twice, so that the world may know and believe that the Father has sent his Son. And he adds that in verse 23, that it would know that the Father sent him and loved him as he loves the Son. I'm sorry, and loved them as he loves the Son. He is not praying for unity for the sake of unity. It is unity that is meant to go beyond the worldly understanding of unity. And, is, and it is so that through the church, through what the church is doing, the video we just watched, through the actions of that church, those people may see the truth about the groom Jesus, that he loves them and cares for them. 
that he and the Father are indeed one, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that he alone is worthy of worship. And what does it look like in our lives and in the church when we have that unity? Again, as I said last week, it doesn't mean that we're thinking exactly the same or, or talking exactly the same or believing even exactly the same, but to be united as Jesus prays for us here will bring about two things in our lives and in our church. The first is back in verse 13. If we are united together as Jesus prays, there's going to be a fulfillment of joy in our lives and there's going to be a fulfillment of joy in our churches. That churches will be a place that first and foremost is filled with joy. I, I've only been, and I'm not gonna say where this was, when this was, who this was, what the nomination was. I've only been to one church service that I would say was a, was a negative church service. And what I mean by that is the extent of the 30 minutes of preaching I heard was the pastor telling us about what ways of the world he was upset about that week. And I'm not gonna tell you, like I said, I'm not gonna tell you who, where, what, when, or, but I just remember leaving this church and feeling just this sense of dread, just having heard about the things that he hated for the last 30 minutes. I've left churches feeling heavily convicted, but even in righteous conviction, there's still a joy in knowing that our God is molding us into the likeness of his son. This wasn't conviction I was feeling, it was dread. And it was borderline depression. And I wasn't there that morning, and I don't think you're here this morning, to hear me talk about what sins of the world the church has to actively go be against or hear me complain about how wrong the world is. Jesus already told us that plainly. I would hope that you're here this morning to be reminded of who Jesus is, what he has done, and to hear about it from his word alone and not just from me. When the church is united, as Jesus prayed it would be, there is unshakable and contagious joy that we take with us out of this place not feelings of dread, hearing about how terrible the world is. We know that it is, but he's called us out of this place to take joy to a world that is dying. And finally, on top of joy, there is love. A word that surprisingly, for as often as he talks about it, surprisingly, we don't get the first occurrence of the word love in the high priestly prayer until verse 23. But then once he mentions it, the floodgates are open. And that is the rest of the extent of the prayer. Verse 22, the glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. There's that call for unity. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me, with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. A unified church is a joy-filled church that reminds one another often of who Jesus is and what he has done for them, that the joy of the Lord is their strength. And a unified church is a love-filled church. A believer unified with his fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord lives a life filled with joy to be with them and a life filled with love to serve them. And we can be unified, we can have joy, and we can love boldly because the very first request that Jesus made in this prayer was fulfilled when he prayed it, that the Father would glorify his Son. There is not one part of this prayer that was answered with a no. 
Every answer to this prayer was yes, because the son knew the will of the father. And if you're sitting there saying, well, certainly everything that Jesus prayed would have been responded to with a yes, I would remind you of the Garden of Gethsemane. And so just like last week, I ask you to do that, to ask the difficult questions of self-discovery. Is there that lack of joy in our life? A question we posed last week, but I think one important enough to ask ourselves again today. Is there a lack of not only joy, but love in my life? And do those lacks, should there be any in my life, stem from a lack of unity with my fellow brothers and sisters and with the church body? If there is a lack of any of those things in your life, the unity that Jesus has prayed for, the joy that he called would be fulfilled in our lives, and the love with which the Father has loved us, know that you have to be prudent. You have to do the difficult work of finding out why. Because when we lack unity, when we lack joy, and when we lack love in this life, we lack one of the very things that Jesus found it most crucial to pray for his disciples right before he left this world. And if I can leave you with one thing this morning, it's this. If something is important to Jesus, important enough, again, for him to bring it to the Father in prayer and repeat it multiple times, it ought to be equally as important to us as well. He wants and is calling his church to be as he is, and as his relationship with his father is, unified, joy-filled, and loving beyond anything this world has ever seen. As the worship team comes, will you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you that we have a great high priest that right now is seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us. And I thank you that mere hours before his betrayal and arrest that would lead to Calvary, he still found it within himself that he needed to pray for the disciples. And I pray that we would reflect on the things of this prayer often. That your son has called us to unity, not for the sake of unity, but unity so that we can go out from this building and show a world that is dying and is, is against the ways of God, show the world joy and love that goes beyond any worldly understanding. It's what Jesus displayed during his time on earth and what, it's what he's calling us to display right now. Father, we pray, as I've prayed so often, that in a world that is so divided right now that your church would continue to be a beacon of unity. Allow us to not become divided over the trivial things we so often become divided over, but to be united around the cross of Jesus through everything. Again, we thank you for your son, for the gift that he is, and that right now he intercedes on our behalf to the Father. We pray all these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I mean, I'm thankful to be part of a love and joy-filled church this morning. It's filled with love and joy because we know the one who's able. We know the one who fills it with love and joy and mercy and grace and forgiveness. Amen. Amen. And um, he surrounds us today. Let's all stand together as we close our service and continue to worship him, singing the blessing. And with the reminder that he goes before us. He goes beside us. He goes behind us. He's on every side. And we can trust him this morning to lead us and guide us and get a joy in the salvation that he gives for us this morning.
children and their children. as we go this morning, would you pray with me? Father, again, we just pray that your church, not just us here at Colerain and the Western Network, but that your church would be united, would be one as you and the Father are one. We pray that in your church right now, that the joy of the Lord will be fulfilled in what is happening in the church that your joy would continue to be our strength in the midst of troubles. And finally, Lord, we pray that when we step outside of these walls, as people leave their churches this morning, that the love of God will be evident in everything they do and everything they say to everyone that they come across. Allow your joy and Thank you, Lord, that we have a God who intercedes for us. Thank you, Jesus. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus this morning. Amen. Church, go and have a great week. And again, happy Mother's Day.